Okay, today is May 2nd, 2011. This is our last class meeting together. Next week we will have the final examination. It's been a pleasure spending time with you every Monday. And those of you who are graduating from the certificate, good luck to you. And those of you who are getting your master's degree in child advocacy, good luck to you as well. Um, before we go, I want to talk about a subject within the confidentiality module that I neglected to mention, although it was among your readings, and that was the victim counselor privilege. But before I begin that, because I record all of these lectures for posterity, I just want to mention for the recording and for the lecture that I'll post that today is the evening after the day in which Osama bin Laden was killed and buried, and a great day for America. I, um, I was on this iPad last night when a little pop-up icon came on and said that uh, the President of the United States would be speaking at 10.30. Well, he didn't speak until almost midnight. So I clicked around or scrolled around on the iPad and I learned very quickly that he was expected to talk about the death of Osama bin Laden. And he did. And you knew it had to be big because very rarely, I can't think of any instance where an American president went on the air at almost midnight on a Sunday. Some of you were watching Celebrity Apprentice. Did they interrupt Celebrity Apprentice? Oh, they took it off. Well, that might be the next president of the United States, the host of that show, right? No, I don't think so. I doubt it. It's probably not a coincidence. Right? By the way, if someone unearths this audio recording, yes, Donald Trump, the pompous, self-absorbed, perhaps billionaire, is talking about running for president and saying the most outrageous and illogical and asinine things to the media. But that's one way to catapult to the top of the polls, huh, I guess? In any event, back to what we are here to talk about, and that is child advocacy. One of the things that I neglected to talk about last week was the victim counselor privilege. We learned when we talked about confidentiality that there are three sources of confidentiality. We went over them over and over again, but I will recite them once again because the exam is imminent. The first source of confidentiality are laws, laws that make certain discussions, certain records confidential. The legislature passes a law, they declare DIFAS records confidential, they declare medical records confidential, they declare police reports confidential, then they are confidential. So statutes or laws make things confidential. The other source of confidentiality are the ethics of a profession the ethics of perhaps nursing or medicine or the ethics of social work or the ethics of, of um, uh, lawyering might make it a breach of the professional ethics to reveal confidential information. Thus, confidentiality can arise from the ethics of a certain profession. Psychology, for example. The American Psychological Association, the APA, has certain guidelines and ethical principles, and if you don't follow them, you're in trouble with the APA, and you may even lose your license. The last source of confidentiality are evidentiary privileges. The word evidentiary refers to the book of evidence or the rules of evidence that govern what happens in a legal proceeding. A book of evidence has only one purpose, and that purpose is to let the judge or the hearing officer or the person in charge of a legal proceeding know what kinds of information are admissible or relevant or pertinent to whatever's being reviewed and hopefully resolved in a legal proceeding. So the rules of evidence govern what kind of information goes before the judge or jury. Within the rules of evidence are privileges, and that is the third source of confidentiality, privileges. They only apply in legal proceedings. 
The word privilege simply refers to the fact that certain witnesses are privileged not to give testimony. In America, we are entitled to every person's testimony. You cannot tell the court in New Jersey or California or Kansas or Maine or Texas or Nebraska or Utah or anywhere in the state that you will not testify. If you do, you will go to jail. You will be held in contempt. We are, when I say we, the criminal justice and the civil system and the family system, the court system in America is entitled to every person's testimony. Every person's, unless you have a privilege. That's the only way out of being a witness. And that way out is considered a privilege. Because certain relationships are so important, certain relationships are so sacred, so sacrosanct, that the law respects them by permitting you not to be a witness. And it doesn't matter what the crime is. It could be criminal mischief, or it could be a quadruple rape homicide. You still do not have to testify. And the one privilege that I didn't mention last week, and it was among your readings, is the victim counselor privilege. The victim counselor privilege. Certain counselors, specifically those who counsel victims of crime, are privileged not to be witnesses in court proceedings. But in order to meet the requirements of that privilege, a couple of things have to happen. Number one, you have to be a victim counselor. And if you look at the PDF that's in Learning Module 7, it spells out how to be a victim counselor, or it refers to it. You have to have 40 hours of training in some approved program. The thing is, you can't just hang a shingle or open a business and say, I counsel victims. You may, and you may be real good at it. But unless you have the 40 hours of state training that the rules of evidence in New Jersey require, you ain't a victim counselor for purposes of New Jersey law. So you need to have 40 hours of training. The victim has to be in a relationship with you, has to be attending counseling with you as a victim counselor for the consequences of their victimization. Now you might be a counselor, you might be a psychologist, you may have a business, and you may treat a variety of different clients, including victims of crime. You may even, you may even have the 40 hours training. But if your client is seeing you, if your client is attending therapy with you for psychological problems arising from a divorce or because of nightmares they're having because they were in a terrible car accident, if they are having a discussion with you and they are in a clinical professional relationship with you for something other than victimization by a crime, then it's not protected. The relationship needs to be one where you are in counseling to deal with the consequences of your victimization. So, once again, there is a victim counselor privilege. You need 40 hours of training, so the therapist has to have a specific document and a specific course of training that demonstrates that they are a victim counselor under New Jersey law. If that's the case, then the victim, the client, has to be seeing that therapist and being treated, and be treated for the consequences of their victimization. Let me give you an example. Suppose, suppose somebody is a bachelor level social worker. Nothing wrong with that. Suppose that they were able to provide counseling under the supervision of a master's of social work. Suppose this counselor does not have the 40 hours of training. And they were seeing a client. And that client was talking to them about the consequences of their victimization. Well, because that counselor doesn't have the 40 hours of training, the discussion that they had is probably not privileged because they miss an important requirement, right? They don't have the 40 hours of training. Change the facts. That same counselor has the 40 hours of training. 
So he has met that prerequisite. But he is counseling. We'll get rid of the but. He is counseling this woman for the victimization of her crime. Because she was the victim of a crime, a rape, an assault. It doesn't matter. If it's a crime, it counts. It counts, and it's covered under the rule of evidence. But in discussing that, they also engage in discussions about marital infidelity. Or they also engage in discussions because the woman's having a hard time sleeping because she's having nightmares based upon a terrible car accident she was in. Or because when she was a child, she was physically abused. Well, that might be a crime, so I have to take that one off the table. I'm thinking as I speak here. My point is, if the dialogue, if the conversation, if the therapeutic communications are about something other than the consequences of victimization, they're not privileged. Okay? So there is a victim counselor privilege, and it applies to statements that a victim makes to a counselor about their victimization. As simple as that. Except that counselor has to have the 40 hours of training. That's the last piece of confidentiality that I wanted to um, share with you that I neglected to last time. Does someone have a question about confidentiality or the victim counselor privilege? All right. When we left last week, we were talking about and got in a discussion in some amount of detail about expert testimony and expert witnesses. Someone tell me what a lay witness is, the peculiarly described lay witness. What's a lay witness? Teddy says, anybody who has information, a social worker, a child abuse investigator, yes, Al? Right, somebody who's involved in the case. It has a connection to the case, but more than that, they not only are involved in the case, but they saw something, they heard something, they perceived something. They have information, as Teddy puts it. What about an expert witness? Does an expert witness necessarily have to be involved in the case itself or been around when the event happened as in court? Go ahead and do that. That's right. And what about that subject matter? What does it have to be related to? It's imperative that he knows the best possible about the case. That's true, too. It's important that he knows or she knows in the case of a child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome witness as little or perhaps nothing about the case. And I'm going to make that make more sense in a moment, though, so hold that thought. But yes, the expert has to know a little bit more than the average person about a subject matter. And that subject matter has to be relevant to the case, right? It has to be important to the case and to resolving the case and understanding the case. So that's what you have. A lay witness is somebody who saw something, heard something. They're part of the case, typically. And an expert witness is someone who has superior knowledge that comes in and shares that knowledge with the court, the jury, or the judge. Either it could be specifically about the case. Or it might be as a lecturer or a dissertation type witness. Did I make that distinction last week about the difference between a, an expert witness who comes in and provides information without knowing anything about the case and someone who gives an opinion? I did. I talked about opinion. I talked about the fractured femur. In my opinion, this femur could not have been an accident because the child fell off a changing table about four feet high. So, and there are other ways. When physicians and pediatricians testify about the uh, medical examination, the gynecological examination, the sexual abuse examination that was conducted, they may give an opinion about the presence or absence of medical evidence. I think I showed you Dr. Julia DeBellis' testimony, correct, in a court case. And she went on and on and on about why there is no evidence. And the case law in New Jersey allows the experts to come in and explain why there is no evidence, right? We heard about how kids heal. 
you've heard about people's misperceptions about what hymenal tissue is and how easily it may or may not be damaged and what it looks like and how things can go in and out of it. We heard about how tissue heals differently, that the tissue that makes up the genitalia of female children heals differently than other bodily tissue, that it is more akin to the tissue that's in the inside of our mouths. All of that, you would think the expert would come in and say why there's evidence or why I examined the child and why I concluded that this child was penetrated. Well, unfortunately, for some of the reasons that I just mentioned, medical evidence is very rare in child sexual abuse investigations. So what we do do is we bring in that expert to be a lecture type witness, an information witness, to give the jury information about something that's important to the case. And in the case of kids, kids that allege penetration, and there is no medical evidence, then we explain to the jury how that could be. Because the jury thinks otherwise. They think there ought to be medical evidence. And we ended by talking about those kinds of things. And some of you told me that a similar dynamic occurs with women who are victims of spousal abuse, right? And men who are victims of spousal abuse. Partners who are victims of spousal violence, right? Because the jury really can't understand. The average person can't understand why somebody who gets beat up would go back home and live with the person. You know? And they may understand why it may have happened once or twice, but they can't understand how they don't just leave them or why didn't they do things differently. So an expert would come in and maybe not even talk about this case, maybe not even know anything about this case, but they would explain to the jury how the typical victim who's battered by someone they love and care for responds to that. They would learn how victim behavior unfolds in a family violence case. And they would learn something that is counterintuitive, that is contrary or the opposite of their intuition. Intuition tells us we avoid pain, we avoid people who beat us up, you know, that's what intuition and logic tells us. And if we're supposed to go in the jury room and use our logic and intuition, if we go in there and use our logic and intuition, we will rule against the victim. Same thing with kids. Logic and intuition tell us we avoid pain. Logic and intuition tells us that when someone hurts us, we tell somebody to stop the pain, to stop the hurt, to stop the bodily intrusion. Logic and intuition tells us we don't tolerate this stuff. We do anything in our power to prevent it. Logic and intuition tells us we can always go to mom, right? Logic and intuition tells us that mom's there to keep us safe. Mom's there to protect us from harm. Logic and intuition tells the jury that that's what kids do. They have someone to turn to. Even if the other partner is abusing them and exploiting them and taking an advantage of them sexually, they can always tell mom. And if they can't tell mom, they could have probably told a teacher or a friend at school or maybe a pastor or someone else who's nice. That's what jurors think, and that's not the fact. It don't go down that way. In the vast majority of cases, kids don't tell right away, right? And that's part of what you wrote about in your learning project that was due, right? Kids don't tell right away. And when they do tell, it comes out haphazardly. It comes out in increments, a little bit at a time. They tell some and they take it back. They tell a little bit more and they'll give you a little bit more and then take a little bit back. And when they do tell, sometimes it's conflicted and hard to understand. And sometimes they tell when they're really angry. Sometimes they tell when they're really pissed off. Sometimes they tell at the moment they hate their dad the most. And unfortunately, that's the very moment when they are the least believable. That's the very moment when they are the least credible. And you know, that's the hand that we're dealt as child advocates. But it doesn't mean we have to present our information, we have to present our cases to a jury without even attempting to level the playing field. That's all we want to do. We want to make sure the jury makes their decision. We want to make sure that the family court judge makes their decision. We want to make sure that whoever the decider is, as George Bush used to say, the decider, we want to make sure that whoever the decider is has complete information. You know? 
that they're not deciding or making a decision based upon incomplete information, making a decision based upon intuition or what they think happens when kids are abused. That's why we're allowed to put on experts in the child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome. That's why we're allowed to put on expert witnesses who can explain to a jury how kids respond to sexual abuse, especially within the family, especially intrafamilial abuse especially exploitive abuse by someone the child loves and trusts and is in a subordinate position to. That is the worst predicament of all when it comes to sexual violence. Think about it. You know, the average rape victim is attacked by someone that they don't know. It happens once. It's brutal. It's unfathomable. But then it's over. Sexual violence perpetrated by someone who loves you and supposed to care for you is the worst sexual violence of all because there's no way out. The very person who's supposed to protect you from harm, the very person who's supposed to make sure you live a life safely and securely, the very person who's charged by God and nature to feed you, to care for you, make sure you put your clothes on in the morning, make sure you get to the bus on time, the very person who nature and God and love itself has destined to care for you is taking advantage of you. That's the person you go tell stuff to. So who do you tell? You tell no one, and you get abused. And you get abused over and over again. And eventually, as all people do, and this is what Dr. Summit talks about, as all people do, when faced with trauma, when faced with violence in which there's no way out, you learn to cope. You learn to deal with it. People are able to withstand extraordinary amounts of pain and violence. We all think, and I know I think this way, that I couldn't. But you do, and you will, if you're ever in that situation. And that's what kids have to do. When faced with an overwhelming force, when they are in a position in which there is no way out, nowhere to run, and no one to tell, <coughs> they deal with it. They cope. They figure out every strategy imaginable to get out of that situation not physically, but psychologically. Madness may even come in the end, unfortunately. <clears throat> and that kind of madness is what we call clinically dissociation. They go somewhere else. They deal with it in their own way. Sometimes they stay late at school. Sometimes they try to lock their doors with nails and crude hammers. Sometimes they wear baggy clothes so they don't appear sexually attractive to the molester. Sometimes they run away. Sometimes they do it and get it over with quick. All of these things are ways of coping. They're ways of surviving. They're ways of getting up the next day, the next morning, and having a somewhat normal childhood. But the average person on the street don't understand that. It's not even close. They don't understand how people react. They think they know how they react. They think they know how the average person should react, but they don't. And there are now years and years of sexual abuse cases and incest cases that have validated Dr. Summit's research. It is unassailable in my book. What that means is it's solid. Now, there are aspects of it that have come under attack recently, but even those attacks, I think, are ill-informed and not legitimate. But the notion that kids tell right away is not true. They don't. And the notion that kids, when they do tell, tell at all is untrue. And the notion that when children do tell, they stand by their statements is not true either. Some of them do take it back. And the way that we educate juries is by putting an expert witness on the stand. And that expert witness will testify, not about this kid in this case, but they'll talk about some of the dynamics that I just talked about a moment ago. They'll talk about, in a general way, the child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome. They'll tell the jury the inside baseball information. They'll tell the jury 
the very specific stuff about child maltreatment that they don't know about. They'll educate the jury. And that's what we started out by saying is that the, the expert witnesses the expert witnesses know a little bit more than the average person about a subject that's relevant. In this case, when I say in this case, in the case of sexually maltreated kids, it is relevant for the jury to understand why the kid didn't tell right away. Because the first thing that those jurors are going to do when they go into the jury room is say, why didn't you tell somebody? I can understand why she didn't tell the first time or the second time, but why not the third time? But why didn't she tell a teacher? These are the ways that we assess credibility as jurors if we're not informed. And that doesn't mean that kids who don't tell right away are always truly victims. You could be a fabricator. You could be overstating what happened. You could not be a victim at all. You could be lying. You could be deceptive. You could make a claim of abuse and claim it happened in the past and not tell right away. What we want to communicate to jurors and fact finders and deciders is that, yes, if a kid doesn't tell right away or a kid says, I made it up and takes it back, that could be why. They could be taking it back because it didn't happen. But guess what? They could be saying it didn't happen because it did and they're afraid or because it did and they just want the case to end or they just want their family to be like it used to be. There are other ways to interpret a statement that I made it up and it never really happened, other than it never really happened. That's one of the reasons they may have said that. And the defense lawyer is going to say that. And I think a prosecutor or a DAG, who's professional and credible, should say, it could be that it never happened. The reason why this young lady said this happened and now tells you in court today I made it all up, could be because it never happened. She did make it all up. But there are other reasons why she may have said she made it all up. Here they are. You will hear an expert, and the expert will tell about the child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome. That kind of expert, that kind of expert witness, is a lecture or dissertation expert witness. And in the case of child sexual abuse, that expert cannot examine the child. We do not allow in New Jersey expert witnesses to opine, to give an opinion about whether they believe a child was sexually molested or not. We don't allow that. Now that happens in the family court sometimes, within the civil courts, but not in our criminal courts. And it very rarely happens in the family courts as well. We do not permit in the state of New Jersey expert witnesses to give an opinion about the ultimate fact of abuse. Therefore, it is pointless for the expert who's going to testify in a child sexual abuse case or an incest case to know anything about the case. The more they know about the facts of the case, the more likely it is they're going to slip up and somehow their opinion is going to be implied. The very fact that they know about the case and the jury knows that they know about the case, suppose, for example, it came out that the expert did meet with the child and interviewed her for 45 minutes and heard her account of victimization. But no one asks that expert any other questions about that. Every question to that expert from the time he takes the witness stand to the time he goes out the door is just about the general syndrome, as if he read the syndrome aloud and walked out. The fact that that expert is sitting in court today on behalf of the prosecution or on behalf of the DAG, the courts have said, sends an indirect message to the jury that they believe the kid. However implausible or attenuated or distant that is, however long you must go to connect those two dots, the courts have said it's enough. It's enough to infect the integrity of the trial. You follow what I'm saying here? The expert meets with the kid, interviews the kid, says nothing else other than testifying about what the syndrome is all about. The courts have ruled that the jury might think that, hey, if she's testifying for the government, she must believe it. And she also met with the kid. 
If she met with the kid and understands this syndrome article thing, she must believe the kid. Why would she testify for the government? So we're getting back to what you offered earlier, and that was they shouldn't know anything about the kids. Because their only role is, is to talk about how kids go through abuse and how they deal with it and how sometimes they take it back. And you don't need to interview the kid and say that. That's why I say to you, any one of you social workers who works for DIFUS that's been doing this for five years, you could be an expert in these cases. Because you've seen enough cases. If you've been doing it, take, if you've seen enough cases to understand how kids respond to abuse. You've seen more than a few recantation cases. You've seen more than a few cases where the teenage girl discloses in the middle of a heated argument about that or some other monumental issue in her teenage world. You've seen them. You've seen more than a few cases where kids say that they were abused between 6 and 9 and they're 11. You've seen more than a few cases that involve delayed disclosure. And that's the only purpose for expert testimony is to explain how kids react. Yes, Teddy. For example, in the video uh, that we watched, you know, with Dr. Christine Baker, um, so if she were to be the counselor for that particular kid, so you can use her to explain the child that gives accommodation syndrome, as in the case was in court. Teddy said, we're going to look at that video in a minute, but Teddy's saying or asking, if the child is in counseling because she was referred there as a result of what was disclosed, or if the child is in counseling because they've been in counseling for other reasons. And that counselor is offered as an expert witness in court about the syndrome. What's the impact of that? Does that create problems? And I think it does. Unless the jury never hears about that. If the jury never hears that that child is in counseling with the expert, then you don't have a primary problem about the jury inferring that the counselor believes the child. You have a secondary problem, though, because we didn't get to that yet, but there are ethical rules and issues that arise when someone is the counselor for the child and also an expert witness for the government. And we'll talk about that a little later. There are questions about whether there is an internal conflict there, whether you can advocate for the child at the same time be objective for the government as a witness. Advocacy for the child doesn't always involve objectivity. You have to do what's in the best interest of the child. On the other hand, when you become an expert witness, sometimes you may have to betray what you're supposed to be doing for the child in order to be absolutely candid and fair and objective in the courtroom. So there is, there is um, some degree of concern and controversy about, in the psychological field, about being an expert witness as well as being a clinician for the child who is the victim in the case. We'll talk about that more in a moment. Al? Uh, in the testimony of Dr. Bellis that we saw, Yes. Was, was she also not allowed to give her opinion on that testimony, or could she have given her opinion? I think the child's name in that case was Destiny, and Dr. DeBellis evaluated Destiny. She did a medical exam, head to toe, head to toe. She could give her opinion in that case. However, there were no findings, so her opinion was that Destiny's normal exam does not rule out the possibility of sexual penetration. And here's why. And that's what the rest of the synopsis that I gave you, I heavily edited that. But. So the answer to your question is yes, she's an opinion witness. She's a fact witness. That's a medical exam. We're talking about behavioral science and psychology. And in New Jersey, we don't allow behavioral scientists or psychologists to testify in court about their opinion of whether a child was molested or not. Out. Medical doctors in, opinions okay. Behavioral scientists, psychologists about whether a kid was abused, out. Impermissible.
Well, here's the thing Teddy brings up at page 222 in your text. You don't have to go there, but Professor Myers, who, who wrote this textbook, talks about avoiding dual relationships. And that's what I was talking about. Being the child's counselor as well as the expert witness presents some ethical quandaries. There is some disagreement among different professional groups and organizations. For example, the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children says forensic evaluations are different from clinical evaluations and generally require a different professional stance and additional components. They're talking about whether you ought to evaluate the child for forensic purposes while at the same time you are an advocate for the child. And I just made the point that that presents some conflicts. The American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law says treating psychiatrists should generally avoid agreeing to be an expert or to perform evaluations of their patients for legal purposes because a forensic evaluation usually requires that other people be interviewed and the testimony may adversely affect the therapeutic relationship. APSAC, the American Professional Society on the Abuse of Children, says further, when a professional is called upon to engage in more than one professional role, such as therapist and then advocate, investigator and therapist, assessor and healer, the professional must be clear that there are different responsibilities and tasks required for each role. And you need to communicate that to your, that to your clients. And some professional organizations say you should be completely separate anyway. The Association of Family and Conciliation Courts says that a person who has been a mediator or a therapist for any or all family members should not perform a custody evaluation because the previous knowledge and relationships may render them incapable of being neutral and objective. So it goes on and on. The takeaway here for you students is you ought to avoid being the child's advocate therapist and the government's forensic evaluator. They ought to be two different people. We talked about opinion testimony, and then we talked about lecture dissertation testimony, the two general ways that experts are called upon to assist the court and to provide information for the jury. In physical abuse, you will hear experts give their opinion about the mechanism of injury. I gave you examples of fractured femurs and shaken infant impact syndrome or shaken baby. There the expert will come in and they will give an opinion or as we say opine about the mechanism of injury. In that case they'll call to the jury's attention the unique constellation of injuries in a shaken infant impact case typically involving trauma to the torso of the child including fractured ribs not always but typically there is some trauma to the torso or to the ribs as Dr. Cronin calls it and some other pediatricians it's really shake and toss injuries also come secondary to the shake the toss because one can never imagine a child, be shake, a child being shaken so violently with such fury and rage to cause bleeds on the brain and, and burst vessels in the eyes. That kind of significant force, one cannot imagine someone doing that and then gently laying the baby down often the baby is tossed or thrown and thus you get secondary injuries. Back to the expert. The expert would come in and talk about the constellation or group of injuries that are indicative or diagnostic of shaken infant impact syndrome. And as I just said, they tell the jury something like 
when you see bleeding on the brain, those are called hematomas. The most common of which is known as a subdural hematoma, which means under the dural tissue, hematoma meaning a, 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 a bleeding, a bleeding event. So you'll see bleeding. The blood will fill the cavity between the brain and the skull, and you also see swelling because the body reacts to the trauma to the brain by swelling, and the more it bleeds and the more it swells, the brain bangs up against the skull and it causes suffocation or death or serious brain injury. You also see, the expert will tell the jury, retinal hemorrhaging because of the forces that happen when the baby is shaken or swung uh, cause bleeding in the retina within the eyes and you will see in these cases retinal hemorrhaging and sometimes you see fractures either because the baby is clutched so hard that the ribs are hurt or fractured or broken or the baby is tossed onto the floor, onto the bed, onto the couch, some other place. So you see those injuries that are secondary to the shake or swing. And in my opinion, that was the mechanism of injury. That's what the doctor will say. In my opinion, that's what happened in this baby. Because Papa's going to come in and say, I was just hugging the baby, or I was just tossing the baby in the air. We had a shaken baby case where the defense was, you know, and people do that from time to time. It's not good to do, but sometimes with a little bit older kids, you might, oh, you, oh, you push the baby, oh, you, the baby, oh, the baby smiles. That's what they want the jury to think is happening. And they can say that all they want. That's where your expert comes in and they give their opinion. In my opinion, the injuries that I saw when I evaluated this child, when Mr. Jones and Mrs. Jones brought the baby to the hospital, are not consistent with tossing the baby in the air and catching the baby, as described by the defendant in his statement. In my opinion, these injuries are consistent with what has been described in the medical literature as shaken infant impact syndrome. Thank you, doctor. Tell the jury what that is. And then they explain what I explained a moment ago in my way of explaining it. Certainly less clinically and less eloquent than a physician who does this for a living might do. But they explain to the jury how shaken infant impact syndrome or shaken baby syndrome happens. And as a prosecutor or a DAG, our role then is to tell the fact finder to take what the doctor gives us and explain to the fact finder, whether it be the judge or the jury, why that defense doesn't hold water. Does the defense's case hold water? It doesn't hold water. And the reason is, is because, and the doctor says this, and the DAG can drive it home, it requires such force, such fury, such rage to create the kind of back and forth motion or what they call G-forces for the, for the brain tissue to disconnect from the other brain tissue that feeds oxygen to the rest of the body, including the heart. It takes such force for that brain to come unhinged and unmoored from the skull that it cannot happen with simple tossing or caressing or swinging. There is only one other kind of scenario that emergency room physicians, and the only people who ever see shaken baby type injuries are emergency room physicians. It's, it's a situation of acute, severe trauma. It is an ER case every time, and every victim winds up in Pete's ICU sometimes for days if they survive. The only other kind of scenario where you see the kind of violence, and I use that in its generic form, the kind of g-force, the kind of back and forth at such velocity. You know, I was saying shaking or swinging, because you could swing a baby or shake a baby or swing a baby. One shake's enough. You could swing a baby and you can swing a baby with such force and such velocity and such violence that these unusual group of injuries occur. The only other situation in the ER that physicians see this, and they do see it quite commonly, not in little babies, but in grown-ups, 
is what? What do you think? What kind of injury rolls into the emergency room and they look at the brain of the person and it looks just like a shaken baby case? Car accidents, high speed motor vehicles. Don't even have to be high speed, car accidents. And part of the reason is, is the most damage happens in a shaken infant impact syndrome case when it stops. So what happens is, you know, the brain is in there and it's it's it's, it's kind of buoyant and it's has connective tissue and it's you know it's built to withstand some motion and movement, right? But it's that swinging or that shaking where the brain and the skull is going back and forth and with infants there are different dynamics because the cells and the tissue is not fully developed yet and their, their heads and their bodies are still forming and developing. So there are different dynamics for children which add to this shaken infant impact equation. But it's not only the swinging or shaking that causes the injury, but the most injuries cause when a baby stops. When the baby hits the couch or the floor or the rug or wherever the baby stops, the toss, the shake and toss. And in a motor vehicle accident, what happens is, and Dr. Cronick does a nice job of explaining this. Dr. Cronick is a shaken baby expert at St. Joseph's Hospital Medical Center in Patterson, New Jersey, and he's our consult when we have these kinds of cases. Dave Cronick is a brilliant scientist and an expert on these things, and you know he, he uses and tells the Dale Earnhardt story, who was killed. He was a famous uh, I think NASCAR or race car driver, but he drove the like stock cars or not Grand Prix cars, uh, Indy 500 kind of cars, I guess, and and he died on the track. And um, he had a very similar brain injury because what happened was when you go 220 miles an hour and you hit something, you're going this way and then you stop, and that's when all the damage is done. It just stops dead, and the brain careens off of the skull, and it causes serious damage. And that's what happens when you know the, these people um, attack children in this way, uh, usually because of a response to, to crying. Um, but we, we can tell that to the jury, and that's an example of opinion testimony. In our opinion, in my opinion, the mechanism, the mechanism of injury, the thing that did this to the child, was a shake and toss. They would say it so informally, or was a shaken baby. And they would describe with the formal name, shaken infant impact syndrome. Also, there's battered child syndrome. That would be opinion testimony, not lecture dissertation. For our purposes, the only time you're going to hear of lecture dissertation testimony is really with the child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome. That's where you don't talk about the case, you just talk about typical kids. Most of child maltreatment, excuse me, most of child maltreatment have doctors and other professionals giving opinion testimony. And battered child syndrome is a form of opinion testimony. And I think Professor Myers talks about it in the textbook. You have repeat visits to the hospital, repeat visits to the doctor, various injuries in different stages of healing. The child may even make a statement. Um, uh, it is a repetitive and chronic physical battering of kids, basically. But it's actually a medical diagnosis. And a doctor can come in and aid or help the prosecution or the DAG by testifying about battered child syndrome. That's a form of opinion testimony in the realm of physical abuse. One that you don't see too much of, I suspect that if you've been around in the Division of Youth and Family Services for 10 years, you may have one or two of these, or you may have a, a colleague who had one of these, and that is Munchausen Syndrome by proxy, where the caregiver has a mental illness that causes them to fabricate illness or injury to the child and present that child for treatment when in fact the child is perfectly healthy. That's a form of child abuse. But there's risk. Neglect is a form of child abuse, and you may need an expert in certain cases. 
and an expert can come in and testify about medical neglect, children who have illnesses, have to have their illnesses treated, and if caregivers don't treat them, the children can get ill or are at risk of illness or at risk of death, and if caregivers don't take care of those issues, then there are uh, consequences, and you may have an expert come in and talk about what the consequences are and what the potential is from medical neglect. There are a lot of different ways that an expert might testify in a physical abuse case. We talked about sexual abuse. We're not allowed to offer it as substantive evidence. That is, sexual abuse is not a permissible diagnosis. We're only allowed to talk about the typical responses of the sexually abused child, generally and generically. I think I gave you the article I wrote in 2000 among your readings. That's pretty much the point I was making before about how to use these in a criminal case, but that's how you use child sexual abuse testimony in virtually any legal proceeding. I wrote that for prosecutors, but it, it applies in any legal context. Let's take a look at a video clip that will show you the difference between an opinion witness and a lecture dissertation witness. You're going to see the first witness give an opinion as to the sex offender's dangerousness and whether he should be institutionalized for mental health treatment. This is what we call in the law a crawl hearing, K-R-O-L-L. -L. You don't have to remember that, but certain persons who are found to be not guilty by reason of insanity or incompetent to stand trial, they have to have their cases reviewed. And sometimes they wind up being institutionalized because they are a danger to themselves or to others or to property, and thus they are civilly committed. Now this is different from sexually violent predator statutes, which we talked about earlier in the semester. Kansas versus Hendricks. You looked that one up, remember? <laughs> that was the specially, I mean the sexually violent predator statute. I'm talking about general civil commitment, where any one of us, if we were a danger to ourselves, others, or property, it's not about sexuality, it's about dangerousness. Um, we can get evaluated by a psychiatrist, and if a second psychiatrist agrees, you can be civilly committed. That's what the first expert's talking about. He would be giving, and is in fact giving, his opinion. He's talking about this case. The next expert is Dr. Christine Baker. Dr. Baker is a psychologist and a clinician and a former colleague of mine that I used in, still a colleague of mine, I'll say former, um, and she testified for me in a, in a criminal case. But she provided lecture or dissertation expert testimony. She told the jury about the child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome in a very general way without giving an opinion about whether the child was in fact abused. So this will give you some concrete examples of the kinds of testimony that we've been talking about. Okay. Got to get you some volume. Uh, setting. 
as a way of providing funds to prove the service. Keep the family from falling apart because if they're a good person, they won't tell. I mean, 
keep it inside and keep things going as, as uh, they should go in a family situation. They do that in a variety of ways, the accommodation. So you see there, Dr. Baker is... Um, She's not talking about the child in the case. She's not talking about her opinion about anything. She's just talking about the syndrome, the article, and how kids respond to stuff. As a matter of fact, in this trial, my victim in the case was almost 30 years old. Actually, I think she was over 30 at the time of the trial. And we were talking about her behavior when she was little and her sister was little so that the jury understood what might have motivated them to not tell for so many years and also to not object to the abuse and go along with it or accommodate. But again, Dr. Baker doesn't say anything about the kid or the case, and she didn't know anything about the case. I didn't tell her anything about it. I just told her I need you to tell the jury about the syndrome. and. You want to let the expert know what you want them to focus on. I said I want you to focus on, I believe, delayed disclosure and accommodation. Uh, the last expert you're going to see is an expert for the defense. Hold that thought till after this video. The defense can put on their own lecture or dissertation expert, and this expert is attempting to undermine Dr. Summit's article and suggest that it is uh, not persuasive certain predictions, and if you do research and show that those predictions are borne out, then they have to give some weight and support to the theory. The problem with the theory of child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome is that if a child says they were sexually abused and then repeats that consistently, whether it's in the same interview or in subsequent interviews, then we take that as evidence that the child sexual abuse occurred. But if you'll notice, the last of the five stages is called retraction. So if the child says, no, I made it all up, or, you know, somebody told me to say it, or something of that nature, the people who believe in child sexual abuse and accommodation syndrome go, aha, that's the first stage, that's retraction. Therefore, it means that it occurs, that it occurred. So whichever happens, whether the child says it did happen and says that repeatedly, or the child takes it back, it sort of predicts that that can cause child sexual abuse. You can't have a theory where contradictory information like that fits into the theory either way in terms of untestable theory. Well, the problem with that expert testimony, if you want my commentary, is that's not what the syndrome says. He is arguing to the jury or lecturing the jury about why uh, the syndrome is not persuasive, he's arguing that child advocates believe that if the child recants, then it proves that it happened. Or if the child exhibits behaviors that are consistent with the typical child, then it must be true. But that's not the theory of the syndrome nor the theory of the prosecution in these cases. The purpose of this testimony is to educate the jury about possible alternative explanations for this child's behavior. That is, she didn't tell right away and it could still be true. We're not saying that if they don't tell right away, then they must be victims, or it must be true. And he is really confusing the purpose of the syndrome. And he is misleading the jury about the purpose of the government in that case, suggesting that it's diagnostic. That's the number one rule about the syndrome. It's not diagnostic. This isn't medicine. It's just observational and behavioral science. I'm sorry, you had a, um, you wanted to tell us something or ask a question? The question was, are the expert witnesses paid? Some are and some aren't. Depends upon what institution that they work for. Um, the Division of Youth and Family Services has contracts with certain experts. Uh, sometimes, as part of that contract, the expert will testify for the state, either the prosecutor or the DAG. Sometimes they'll work pro bono, but most of the time, 
they work contractually and they get paid. Um, I guess the answer to your question is almost all of them get paid, but some of them are on retainer, so to speak. They may have been paid a long time ago for the original evaluation and may never have to testify in court in support of that evaluation in the case of battered children and physical abuse kids. But yeah, they get paid for their time. So I have a question. Yes. Now, I was just wondering, I've not heard in any of well, my cases where an expert witness was called, but then you talk about professionals doing evaluation. So we, we pick a psychologist who did an evaluation on a client. And I guess when we go to trial, sometimes this professional is called to testify. What is, uh, I'm, I I'm trying to figure out where that professional falls into. That professional would almost always be an expert witness. What kind of professional? If you had a nurse that came in who the child was referred to for an examination, and they came to court to testify about what they saw, they would be an expert. Okay. They were not part of the case until, when I say we, until the government, until DIFUS asked them to be. Um, on the other hand, you know, the mom, the dad, the siblings, the neighbors, the teachers, they would be lay witnesses. Um, that nurse uh, would be an expert witness. But then what, who, what will the psychologist be? Because he evaluated it. That would be an expert witness. That, that psychologist who evaluated the client and then later comes to court or to some other legal proceeding to tell about that evaluation would be an expert witness. Okay. Yes, the, the psychologist makes a diagnosis sometimes and then makes recommendations at the end of their, um, uh, I guess, report. So, yes. Okay. Psychiatrist uh, can make a diagnosis and sometimes recommendations. That would be um, classic expert testimony. Any other questions about uh, expert testimony versus lay testimony? This video clip is of the child interview specialist, and she would be considered a lay witness, even though she's a professional. May I show this to you? Yes, sir. Thank you. State calls Fran Raguso, please. Fran Raguso. Mr. Gross, you want to come forward, please? Just watch your step over here, and then as you come into the witness box, watch your step again. I see the glass. Mr. Freed's going to be the first one to come. Thank you. Mr. Gross, good morning. Mr. Gross, what do you employ? Uh, the State County Prosecutor's Office, the Special Victims Unit. And what capacity are you so employed? I was going to offer uh, forensic investigative candidates for children that have alleged physical and sexual abuse under the age of 12. And uh, for how long have you been with us? I have been there since November 27, 2001. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your position, please. Um, basically, what I what I do is I'm housed at the Child Advocacy Center, which is a residential home in Patterson. Um, whenever we get referrals or complaints that come into our unit, uh, if the child is under the age of 12, I will assist the detective in conducting that interview with that child. Mr. Russo, uh, were you so employed uh, in this matter at the time of Tuesday, uh, October the 8th, 2002? Yes, I was. Okay. Calling your attention to that date, uh, do you recall becoming involved in an investigation that uh, surrounded an allegation of child sexual abuse with an alleged victim by the name of Destiny Ruiz? Yes, I did. And could you please uh, tell us how you became involved in this investigation? Um, I had received a referral that day approximately about 10 o'clock in the morning from a Jacqueline Ventura, that I guess caseworker, who stated that she had... Objection, Your Honor. Without telling us what she was... All right, so let's sustain the objection. Let's hear it. Just don't tell us what someone else. 
Okay, I had received a referral that day regarding a child by the name of Destiny Ruiz regarding a sexual abuse allegation. Okay, and based upon this referral, what if anything happened? Uh, my sergeant at the time, Frank Feeney, assist me, assigned me to assist Detective Steve Beatty in conducting the interview of Destiny Ruiz. Okay, and uh, tell us how this came about. Um, what happened is, is that while I was working at the Child Advocacy Center, Detective Steve Beatty um, had arranged for Destiny Ruiz and her mother, Elizabeth, to come to that center. And I uh, said so in the Child Advocacy Center? Yes. Tell us a little bit about the Child Advocacy Center right now. Uh, the Child Advocacy Center is set up for children that are under the age of 12, and it's basically a residential home. When you walk into the first floor, there's a waiting area with a TV and toys for the kids to play, uh, couches, little tables, things like that. It's separated by a door, so on the first floor, there's two private offices in the back, along with a bathroom. Uh, those are both separated by doors. Um, if you walk upstairs, there's an interview room, which is um, to the right, and that room basically just has an easel and a chest that has anatomical dogs in it, if I do use those. Um, and then in the room next to it holds all our technical equipment, the video equipment, and whoever for that day will be monitoring the technical equipment. And there are uh, all interviews of children under the age of 12 that allege this kind of abuse conducted here? Yes. And why is this so? They're all conducted up there in that interview room. That's where um, all my interviews are being taken and recorded. And uh, why have the interview uh, at the Child Advocacy Center as opposed to someplace else at the police station? We feel that the Child Advocacy Center is less intimidating, less traumatic for a child uh, to walk into a house which is child friendly and walk into a detective bureau. Now, on that day, on October the 8th, 2002, you just told us how uh, Detective Baby had a mainstream uh, tell us what happened. Um, tell us the, the first steps you took in this uh, situation. Um, Destiny and her mother Elizabeth showed up at the Child Advocacy Center. I um, briefly introduced myself to the mother and the child, letting them know who I am and what I would be doing that day. Then I escorted Elizabeth Vegetable back to my private office, and um, I conducted an intake statement. Mommy and Elizabeth Pedro? Yes. And what, is the, uh, <coughs> what sort of information did you elicit uh, from Elizabeth? Did you elicit from Elizabeth during this party? I let Elizabeth know that I'm going to be interviewing her daughter, that um, I basically get pedigree information from her, date of birth, addresses, things of that nature. And then I do ask her what brought her to the center that day. Um, and I also then asked her to come out there to the waiting room, introduce me to Destiny again, let Destiny know that she's going to be talking to me, and let, it's, let Destiny know that it's important for her to tell the truth, and that the truth is really what happens. Um, and Elizabeth complied with all that okay. in my presence. Was Destiny present for your uh, intake interview with Mom? No. And she was again located in the waiting area? Yes, she stayed outside in the waiting area, separated by a door, and then we were separated by another door into my private office, where me, Detective Steve Beatty, and Elizabeth were all sitting. Uh, after your pre-interview, or your intake interview with Ms. Bedrigal, and then after Ms. Bedrigal brought you, uh, or went out back outside the waiting area with Destiny, and the information was related to Destiny, what happened next? I then escorted Destiny upstairs to the interview room, where I conducted my interview about Destiny. Okay. Mr. Russo, prior to entering the interview room, uh, did you interview Destiny at all uh, pertaining to any of these allegations? No, I did not. And your interview began when you entered the interview room? Yes, I did. Yeah, the interview started. And that so although Fran Raguso is an employee of the prosecutor's office and a professional, her testimony here is not as an expert. She is simply describing what happened that day. She is involved in the case now, in the case, with the kid, because she interviewed the kid. So by coming to court, she's testifying as a fact witness or a lay witness. She's not giving her opinion nor is she educating the jury about a subject matter that is relevant to the case and needs to be explained. She is simply testifying about the process of interviewing this little girl, Destiny, at the Child Advocacy Center. And she's describing what happened. I met the child, I met the mother, I asked the mother what happened, I told the mother 
to tell the child to be truthful and that I was going to bring her upstairs and interview her. And then I brought her upstairs and I interviewed her. So she's a fact witness. She's a lay witness. And a particular kind of lay witness, I use this clip for other reasons, to explain in forensic interviewing and to train interviewers about the process of testifying about your interviews. In these kinds of cases, the interviewer, Ms. Ragusa, would now show the video of the interview. So there's nothing to be said about that. She doesn't testify about it. But if she did, if she was a clinician or we did not videotape, then she would say what happened during the interview and testify. It would never be as complete as watching the video itself. Though. And we don't have to do that because here the video speaks for itself. She, in essence, is setting up the video, introducing the video. That's this testimony, and that's why it's fact testimony. It's about something that happened that she was a party to. Al? Uh, I was going to ask if that is hearsay, but I believe it is, and it's because of the 10 years exception. That's right. It would be hearsay because the video recorded statement that Fran did, despite the fact that she's on the witness stand, was a statement that was made out of court that was offered in court for the truth of the matter. We want the jury to believe that that statement made out of court, offered in court by someone other than the witness, the kid, Destiny, we want them to believe that that is evidence that Destiny was molested. But you answered your own question, Alp. Because of Rule 803C27 or the tender years exception, in this case we can infer that the court ruled it was trustworthy and thus admissible. And that's why this piece of hearsay was about to be introduced. You'll see how typically, or you saw how typically hearsay arises, usually out of the clear blue and when the witness is ill-prepared. I've watched this clip many times, but Fran's eyes get wide and she like, doesn't know what happened. When the lawyer goes, Jackson, hearsay! And Jackie Ventura from Dyke is called into referral and she was saying, and then Jackie Ventura told me, beat, freeze frame, pause, Hearsay, Judge. What? She was about to say what Jackie Ventura told her. What Jackie Ventura told her probably included statements about what the child said. I don't remember this case at all, but other than what I've seen over and over again on these clips. But she may have said something like, or been about to say something like, yes, Jackie Ventura from Dyfus called me and said, that Destiny Ruiz told her teacher at school that her father comes in her bedroom and puts his fingers on her vagina at night. That's why what the defense lawyer did was good from a defense perspective. He stopped that hearsay from coming out. That unreliable hearsay, that unreliable statement of another witness who's not here, subject to cross-examination, and, and is not subject to cross-examination. So the other, you don't see him, his name is Russ Baker. He pulled out hearsay. The judge ruled that it was hearsay and it's not admissible. He tells Ms. Ragusa, don't tell us what she said. The prosecutor's purpose was not to get all that stuff out that I just said probably was what she was about to say. He just wanted to set up the sequence of events that led to her being assigned the case. So he was perfectly happy to have her reformulate her response. He didn't want to get out that destiny told the teacher and the substance of what Destiny told the teacher. So that hearsay was nipped in the bud. There was no exception that I could think of. Jackie Ventura calls Fran on the phone to tell her about what a girl told the guidance counselor or the teacher at school about her father molesting her. Okay. There's no exception that I could think of. It's not a dying declaration. Nobody's dying. It's not an excited utterance. You know, it's not a... Um, contemporaneous statement, it's not a statement to a doctor for purposes of diagnosis or treatment. It may be a tender years exception, I mean, if that's what she said to the teacher, but we're talking about the Jackie Ventura. Jackie Ventura talked to the teacher who talked to the child. So there's no exception, it doesn't come in. And that's a very good example of how hearsay manifests itself in the testimony of professionals including um, including DIFUS workers.
which which is a good uh, transition into the last part of our course, and that is cross-examination and impeachment. It's good that we just saw Fran Raguso because she was a witness... She was a witness in a child abuse prosecution, and her posture, her role, was very similar to the typical CPS or DIFUS worker. You may find yourself in the very same position she did, and you may find yourself sitting in the witness chair and hear an objection based upon hearsay, or any other manner of objections. And what you did see here, Eventually, Ms. Raguso gets cross-examined. And I want to talk about what the purpose of cross-examination is. I mean, this is by no means going to be thorough, uh, but it will at least give you, as a child advocate, some insight into how child advocates are scrutinized by defense lawyers, whether it be family court or criminal court or some other legal proceeding. The purpose of of cross-examination is to cast doubt on the witness's credibility, on the DIFUS worker's credibility or recollection. And there are a number of ways to do that. We're going to focus on what Professor Myers calls impeachment of lay witnesses. I'm not going to focus on expert cross-examination. That's a different kind of cross-examination. You'll hear the term impeachment, and that is the process of challenging someone's credibility or believability. That's the process of challenging witnesses in a legal proceeding. Impeachment. Impeachment. Here are some of the very typical ways that you'll see, and they will happen in every case. In fact, as part of the program here in the Center for Child Advocacy, Chris Freed, who you just saw on that video clip, myself, Susan Curcio, Peter Alvino from the Office of the Attorney General, and a few others have crafted a curricula for preparing DIFUS workers for testimony in court. It's a four-day program, eight hours a day on investigations, documentation, testifying, and video clip review to prepare child protection workers, DIFUS workers, for the challenge of being a witness in a civil case or a criminal case. And we go through all of these issues in great detail, and I have lots of video clips that show you witnesses being attacked on cross-examination and offer suggestions about how to meet those challenges. I'm going to lightly touch on all of them. One way that people's credibility or believability is attacked, one way that witnesses, including DIFUS workers and detectives and lay witnesses, are impeached involves prior inconsistent statements. That is a very basic form of cross-examination. Now, the goal there is to suggest to the fact finder, for the purposes of the rest of this afternoon and evening, I'm going to assume there's a jury listening to this, okay? The purpose of this form of cross-examination is to suggest to the jury that you, let's say the diapers worker, is either being deceptive about what happened, what really happened in this case, or you're confused about what really happened here. And a prior inconsistent statement is very simple. Supposing that you came to court and you testified that when you appeared at the family home to 
to speak to the child that the mother of the child who greeted you at the door was mildly upset that you wanted to talk to her daughter and that she was uncomfortable with that. The defense lawyer later says to you, well, we'll call you Miss Basillo. Uh, the diapers worker is Miss Basillo. Miss Basillo, she was more than uncomfortable, according to you. You felt that she was angry. You felt that she was hostile to you. Isn't that true? No, I didn't feel that way at all. She was, you know, she was upset that I was there. She was a little uncomfortable. Are you sure about that? No, oh, sure, I'm sure. I, she was uncomfortable. She really didn't want to talk to me about this. You know, I, I want to talk to her daughter. She doesn't know me. And she was uncomfortable. Do you remember talking to the grand jury in this case? Or do you remember filing a report on N.J. Spirit about this case? Or do you remember talking to the prosecutor about this case? All of those suggestions are part of the setup. In fact, they won't even ask you, do you remember? They'll state things in clear, direct sentences that call solely for a yes or no. They're allowed to and will ask leading questions all the time. So you need to listen to every word that makes up that leading question and make sure that it's all true before you say yes or correct or that's, that's right. It's almost like a true-false question. If any part of that leading question is false, you better say no. You don't want to put words in your mouth. So he may say something like this. Miss Basile, isn't it a fact that you were asked to come to the prosecutor's office shortly, shortly after the child allegedly told her teacher something happened? Yeah, that's true. And you went down to 401 Grand Street. Isn't that a fact? No, I didn't go to 401 Grand Street. I went to 30 Kings Road in Totowa. That's where they asked me to go. Oh, that's right. Thank you for correcting me. You, you must remember that well, don't you? You remember it was in Totowa, don't you? Yeah, no, it was in Totowa. But you have a good recollection of that because you just corrected me, right? Yeah, no, I do remember going to Totowa. Well, I'm glad you remember it well, Mr. Basillo. Because I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Do you remember meeting with Detective Sergeant Steve Beatty? Yeah, yeah, I do. You know the guy with salt and pepper hair? His office is in the corner by the video review room. You remember going in that office? Yeah, no, I, I remember talking to Beatty. And he asked you a bunch of questions about what happened when you went to the house to talk to Gabriella. Do you remember that? Yeah. Didn't you tell Stephen Beatty, the detective sergeant, that my client was hostile and angry and mean? No, oh, I don't remember that. Really? Judge, can I have this marked, please? Now the setup is reaching full blossom. <laughs> <laughs> because he wants the report marked. He wants to put a little sticker on it that has a letter and a number so that the world knows what this is in future generations. If it gets lost or falls on the floor, we can take that letter and number, we can compare it to a lot and go, aha, this is the report that baby filed. So he's going to mark it for posterity. He's going to take it back. But he's not going to give it to you. It's going to go like this. He'll look at the jury. Is it your testimony, <laughs> Ms. Basillo? that you never told Beatty, the detective sergeant, that my client was hostile? You want to stand by that statement? Now, I can say yes or no. My suggestion to you is you're in this deep, you stick with what you say. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is just because he's inferring that he's got something on here, doesn't mean he's got what he's suggesting he has. He may have something. But it doesn't mean he has what he's suggesting he has. You know? So don't fold over. Don't fold right away. Don't roll over and just accept that what he has there. And don't say, let me see that. I'm not going to show that to you. No, no, that's okay. What is that? What do you think I have here, man? I was just like the doodle. That's just a picture of my wife. <laughs> You want to look at it? That help you remember what's going on, man? So don't play fast and loose. Just be professional. Say, yeah, no, she was upset. Well, that's what I'm getting at here. She was more than upset. Why don't you take a look at S14? 
for identification. Just read the first paragraph to yourself and, and don't say anything, okay? Just read it. Thank you. She reads it. Isn't it a fact that you told Beatty that my client was hostile? I didn't tell him that. Now, if it's his work, you want to stick to that? You know, I, I don't know what the truth is, but the point is you need to answer the questions to the best of your recollection. Don't be lied. I mean, don't obviously don't lie, don't be deceptive, don't be cute, don't be funny. If, if it does say that, say what? Well, I don't remember saying that. I guess it's possible. So it's possible that you said she was hostile. Isn't that right? She was uncooperative. That's not what I asked you. You just told this jury not 11 seconds ago. You know what, Judge? May I have the court reporter? That's okay. You don't have to tell us what you said. May I have the court reporter read that back, please? For, for a look at the judge. Said, yeah, go ahead. Have her read it back. I hate when judges do that, but they do it. Mr. Del Russo, is it possible that you told Mr. Vadia, witness, Vasilo? Well, it's possible that I said that. Thank you, Miss Court Reporter. Remember? I know it's hard to remember stuff that happened a long time ago, Mr. So I really do, but this happened about five seconds ago. Do you remember telling this jury that it was possible? Now, you can go down this path to do it. We're not talking about the kid. We're not talking about the case. We're in this joust, if you will. We're in this debate about a picky you and minor point here. So the lesson here is stick to your guns. Ask, you know, look at the report. If that refreshes your recollection about what happened, then tell it like it is. Say, you know what, that's the way I characterized it back then. But upon reflection, I don't know that hostile was the best word. If you say something like that, you're in good position, you know? But don't fight, don't deny, don't, I mean, tell the truth. I mean, if you don't remember, if Beatty got it completely wrong, then you got to stick to your guns. But if it's your own writing, then what are you going to do? If you're shown a Dyfus report where you wrote the word hostile, now you've got to deal with it. And the way to deal with it, I'm suggesting to you, is acknowledge that it's inconsistent. You know what? I did write that. You know, I remember what happened, and I'm not sure why I wrote it that way back then, but uh, I think a better characterization would be she was upset. It was a poor choice. I did. But you used that word. I did. I used that word. Probably a poor choice of words. You know, they're only going to go this argument. They're only going to waste time and do this for so long. Because eventually the jury starts going, all right, we get it, okay? They start to turn on the advocate, I mean the lawyer advocate. So if you have a prior inconsistent statement and you're confronted with it, and it is inconsistent, and it's from you, fall on your sword. Falling on your sword means accept that you made a mistake and move on. And explain why. Say, you know what? I said that then, but it would probably I probably should have said something more in line if she was upset. That's what she was. As I think about it, as I, uh, she, uh, hostile means she was yelling at me, raising her arms, swinging her hands around. None of that happened, but she was upset. You know? So fall on your sword, explain yourself, and then the lawyer has nowhere to go but move on. Again, the larger point here is prior inconsistent statements. It could be about anything, right? Anything. But the, uh, the purpose is to show you are a poor record keeper or to show that you're being deceptive today, that the truth was the original statement. In fact, a very common way of approaching this is, well, wouldn't you say that your memory would have been better two and a half years ago when you came to my client's door than it is today? Wouldn't you agree to that? Well, I don't know. The answer to that is yes, okay? Yes. There's no person I've ever met who has a better memory today than they did two and a half years ago about an event that happened two and a half years ago in one day. Okay? And even if you are some savant or some special person whose memory gets better with age, <clears throat> just concede the point, okay? And that probably is the best lesson. Too many witnesses get trapped because they argue over mundane points and don't accept and agree to something that they did in the past. If they say something that's true, agree with it and move on. 
Don't worry about the inferences. There will always be another lawyer who could clean up any of these negative inferences or ideas the jury might get because of the way the defense lawyer crafted the question. On the other hand, if he says, and I'll use the male pronoun for these purposes, there are plenty of ferocious women cross-examiners too. Okay. But if she says or he says something that's inaccurate, don't agree with it. I'm not saying that. Listen. But one way to attack the credibility of witnesses is through prior inconsistent statements. And I think I made that point. Bias is another way that witnesses are cross-examined. Bias. Bias simply means favoritism. Favoritism. Sorry about that. Bias simply means favoritism. Let's say, I'll give you a very simple example. Let's say one of your co-workers was being prosecuted for theft. A typist co-worker. Someone who sat in the cubicle next to you. And you were a witness in the case. Well, the defense would show the nature of your relationship with the person who is on trial. The suggestion is that you are biased towards them. That your bias favors your friend who's the defendant. So any questions that you're asked about the behavior of the defendant in the Dyfus theft case are vulnerable to an attack for bias. And in those cases, you just accept what is. And by that I mean, if you are a co-worker, and you are a friend of theirs, and you'd be more likely to see their point of view, accept that. But that is one area you may be cross-examined on. And my purpose here is to let you know what these things look like when they're coming. Yeah. Ms. Carmen, how are you today? Nice to see you. You know, Ms. Vasillo is on trial today, and she's accused of theft. Uh, you know Ms. Vasillo, isn't that true? Yes or no? She did it. <laughs> <laughs> no loyalty here. <laughs> she used to steal my pencils all the time. I didn't ask you that, man. Judge, please instruct the witness to be responsive. <laughs> the, the cross examiner will ask you about the relationship. Is it a fact that you work with Ms. Vasillo? Yes or no? Yes. Is it a fact that you have worked with Ms. Vasillo for the past 10 years? Isn't that true? Yes or no? Yes. In fact, Ms. Vasillo shares the cubicle, uh, shares office space, and is assigned the cubicle right next to you in the diaper's office. Isn't that right? You and Ms. Basillo go to lunch once in a while, isn't that right? Yes. Tell us, when was the last time you went to lunch with Ms. Basillo, Ms. Friday. Carmen? Friday. You went to Ms. Basillo's wedding when she got married last year, isn't that true? Yes. When Ms. Basillo was charged with this crime, you were the first person that she called, isn't that right? She did call you, though, isn't that right? Yes. She asked for your advice about the predicament she was in. Isn't that true, yes or no? She asked you for advice about the predicament she was in. Isn't that true? Well, if she asked for advice, she, she just explained your situation. And did you tell her what your impressions were? Yes. Oh. So this can go on and on. The point is, we are showing that this witness may be favor, maybe favor Ms. Priscilla. Her testimony needs to be looked at very closely. It needs to be scrutinized very closely because she is going to see things subjectively in a more favorable light when it comes to anything about Ms. Priscilla because they're friends. She is biased towards Ms. Priscilla. Bias can arise in a million different ways. It doesn't have to arise from a close friendship. It can arise from lots of different things, but it is one way that you are attacked as a witness in any kind of legal proceeding. If you have a conviction for a crime, that can be 
examined in court. If you are a defendant on trial and that conviction is very similar to the kind of offense that you're on trial for, then they can't say what the crime was. Typically, they can say what the crime is. If Ms. Carmen is the witness and she's a DIFUS worker and she was convicted of um, uh, tax fraud in 1988, then we could bring out the exact offense for which she was convicted and what the penalty was. On the other hand, if Ms. Pasillo, who's on trial for theft, takes the witness stand and we want to impeach her credibility, we want to suggest to the jury they ought to scrutinize her testimony and not believe her, if in a theft case we learn that she was convicted of burglary five years ago, we would have to do what we call sanitize that. So we would be able to bring out that she has a conviction, but we can't say what it was for, because then the jury will hear it's a burglary, they'll think, well, she's probably guilty of this kind of theft, because burglary is a theft. It's a theft in a dwelling or a car or some other secure place. So in the case of a defendant who takes the stand, you can use their prior convictions against them. But if the prior conviction is for an offense that's very similar to the crime that they're charged with, that they're testifying about, then you're not allowed to tell the jury what the crime was. But you could say, was well, it a fact, Ms. Vasillo, 11 years ago, in the state of North Carolina, you were convicted of a crime. Isn't that right? Yes. In fact, they don't even call them crimes in North Carolina. You were convicted of a Class A felony in the state of North Carolina. Isn't that true, Ms. Vasillo? Yes. And for that, you received five years probation. Is that right, Ms. Vasillo? Yes, that's correct. That five years probation included community service, where you had to sweep up at the public library every Friday and Saturday night. Isn't that true? Yes. But you didn't go to jail for that felony that you committed about 11 years ago in the state of North Carolina. Isn't that right? Now, from one thing, a defense lawyer will craft a dozen or so questions. Because he keeps, he wants to keep saying felony and North Carolina in the same breath. Because he wants to turn the jury against the witness based upon the fact that she has a conviction of a crime. One of the ways that we argue, where we suggest to juries and fact finders that someone is not worthy of belief is through a prior conviction of a crime. Let's take off what we've learned so far. Prior inconsistent statements cast doubt on people's credibility. Bias or favoritism could cast doubt on a person's credibility or believability. Right? Prior convictions could cast doubt or make people skeptical of someone's believability or credibility. Go ahead, Michaela. So you're saying Yes. Michaela says if a defendant takes the stand and has a prior conviction that's not similar to the charge that they're, they're on trial for, can you say the whole name of that charge? And he answers yes. I'll change it around. Same defendant, DIFUS worker, Ms. Basillo. Same offense, theft in the DIFUS office. Her prior conviction is not for felony burglary in North Carolina. Her prior conviction is for criminal mischief or possession of hollow point bullets. Here's something that's unrelated to a theft. Isn't it true, Ms. Basillo, that in North Carolina 11 years ago you were convicted of a Class A felony? Yes or no? Yes. Isn't it true that you were convicted of possession of hollow point bullets? Isn't that right? That's correct. In fact, hollow point bullets are bullets that have a little bit of lead at the tip carved out so that there's a greater kill zone. When it impacts upon the bone, it fragments and is more likely to kill someone. Objection, judge. Sustained. Mr. Del Russo. All you can do is bring out the fact that she was convicted of hollow point bullets. We don't need a lecture or dissertation on hollow point bullets and the kill zone. Okay, judge. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, yes, you can bring out the full charge. Even for a criminal defendant, if it's dissimilar or not similar to the charge that they're on trial for. 
And in my little hypothetical, Ms. Masillo is on trial for theft in the diaper's office. Hollow point bullet, not like a theft. Burglary, like a theft. Burglary is a theft. It's a kind of theft. No, the, the, the witness doesn't matter. They're not on trial. So it's, it, it doesn't make... This is about the jury not wanting to convict poor Ms. Basillo because she must be guilty of this theft because she did a theft in North Carolina 10 years ago or 11 years ago. But any other witness, every crime is admissible on the issue of credibility. Any crime. And you can say what the crime is. I mean, you don't spend a lot of time in this. You're really only allowed to say the degree or class of the crime, how serious it is, the name of the crime, and what the penalty was. You should be able to do it in three questions. But a good defense lawyer will turn those three into nine, twelve maybe. Same three questions, but asked in slightly different ways. Because you want, they want to keep reinforcement. They want the jury to hear it over and over again. Repetition, repetition. Well, that's what I just said. A witness, any witness, one of the ways that we attack the believability of witnesses is prior consistent statements, bias, and a prior conviction of a crime. Any witness. For a witness who's not a defendant, any prior crime. It could be the same kind of crime. If Carmen took the stand in Ms. Basillo's case and Carmen was convicted of theft, we can bring that up. It raises an interesting issue, though, because Carmen sits right next to her, and maybe birds of a feather flock together. <laughs> so maybe they might think Miss Basillo is probably guilty because they're best friends of thief. So you might have a half an argument there, and you might be able to challenge the general rule. But uh, no, just forget about that kind of. That, I would make that argument, but let's forget about it for our purposes. Anyone other than the defendant, all crimes come in, name of it, felonies, whatever it is. Defendant. The crime comes in always, the whole crime, unless the crime is very similar to the crime they're charged with and they're on trial for. Now, the other way that we can attack someone's credibility or believability is by some kind of mental impairment, which kind of makes sense, right? If a witness takes the stand, you know, and they've had mental breakdowns in the past or they have psychosis, if they suffer from some illness that makes their judgment impaired. Suppose they're on medication that makes it difficult for them to think when things are happening or it affects their ability to remember stuff. You would want to know that. Any kind of defects in capacity, by that we mean the ability to look at stuff, remember stuff, and say what that stuff is. Perceive, remember, and communicate. If there's something that affects your ability to, to, to see stuff, to then remember that stuff, and then say what that stuff is, then it doesn't mean you can't testify, it just means we get to point that out. Well, isn't it a fact, Ms. Carmen, that you're taking uh, Coca-Cola 2 as a medication? Isn't that right? And your doctor told you that Coca-Cola 2 makes it hard for you to remember things. Isn't that true? Yeah. And you've been taking Coca-Cola 2 since... Well, we're not talking about today, Ms. Parker, but thank you. You've been taking Coca-Cola 2 since 2008. Isn't that right? Yes. Three times a day, correct? Correct? Yes. Now, the, my client, my client, Ms. Basillo, was charged with committing a theft at the diaper's offices in 2009. You remember that, don't you? Yes or no? Yes. You were taking Coca-Cola 2 in 2009 when you claimed to have watched my client take the digital camera that everyone has to share in the diaper's office and put it in her purse so that she can go to Teddy's wedding and take pictures. <laughs> you were on Coca-Cola 2 at the time. Isn't that right? <laughs> that would be an example of a defect in capacity, right? Because her memory is clouded at the time that my client, Ms. Basillo, allegedly took the camera. Inadequate opportunity to observe events. 
is another example. And these are common. You will be cross-examined about these things. And they're legitimate. They're fair. Because the, the, the purpose of this is to show that you know, maybe what you say isn't as concrete as you think it is. So here, the lawyer would show that the witness didn't have enough time to see what happened. You know, questioning might be, well, isn't it true, Ms. Carmen, that when, when you claim that my client was sticking the digital camera into her purse, you were in a very animated phone call with Teddy. Isn't that true? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Because you were helping Teddy with the caterer for his wedding. Isn't that right? Yes or no? Yes. And there was a big issue about the price per head that the caterer was charging Teddy. Isn't that right? Yes. And you felt, you felt that that reflected or impacted upon your relationship with Teddy because you promised Teddy you'd get him $35 a head, and it was $40 a head. Isn't that right? At the very time when you say my client, Ms. Basillo, was putting a digital camera in her purse, you were in the conversation I described, just described with Teddy. Is that true, yes or no? Yes. Thank you. You've been a lovely, lovely <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't say that. That's just the movie, the movie, the movie, my cousin Vinny. The point is, is that she was distracted. She was involved in a conversation, and thus she had an inadequate opportunity to observe the events that were unfolding around her. You can fill in the blanks. There's a million ways that that manifests itself, but that's the way that a, a witness would be impeached. Inadequate opportunity to observe events, to observe what was happening. They're distracted. You're not, you, know, you don't have your full attention on the issue that's being testified about. All of this stuff is at chapter 8 in your textbook, 283, 284, and 285. Now, one of the things that you may have noticed in my cross-examination examples here today, and Carmen was a good sport, thank you, but in my examples here, I asked, every one of my questions was leading, right? There was no opportunity, although Carmen snuck in a couple of uh, spontaneous declarations there, but uh, there was, in the structure of my questions, there was no opportunity for the witness to say anything other than yes or no. And that's what you will see. Has someone in here been cross-examined in the criminal or civil courts? There are good defense lawyers, and some of them don't follow what I think is good practice for defense lawyers, but... Were you cross-examined in a way that was similar? And not in tone. No, you don't have to be obnoxious to be a good defense lawyer, by the way. I'm playing it up here. Some of them are. Not. Um, but you could be a gentleman or a gentlewoman and, and be just as firm and just as closed-ended in the structure of your questions. What was your experience like? Well, I was just last week. Okay. Uh, I agree. He, he, he didn't ask me just an or no answers questions. He was all over the place. Um, he wanted me to speak about the velocity of the object. Um, yes. um, if I felt that the mom intended to hurt the child. Um, and, but, but all things that are beyond your capacity, that's the subject of expert testimony. Um, although you might be able to give an opinion about, unless if you observed it, were you there when this event happened? No. Speculation, right? And uh, severity of the injury, which um, she, he wanted me to describe the injury. By the time I got to the hospital, the young lady's face was already stitched. All of these things are relevant, it seems to me. I don't, I don't know what the hearing was about, but they seem like they were all relevant to the judge's decision, but beyond your capacity. I mean, this is what the judge has to figure out. In essence, they're asking, they want to know the velocity, whether it was intentional. What was the third thing? Uh, if the, uh, if, if, severe, if the injury was oh, severe. severe or not. All of those things, if we were teaching the course that we're doing, all of those things are either opinion or conclusory. So the right way to ask that question would be, see, see severe is conclusory. Was the injury severe? Or I looked at the injury was severe. I don't know what that means, you know? That, that's a conclusion. 
That's like saying someone's drunk. You know, remember we talked about the state troopers are best at explaining themselves? We need the basis for that opinion. So he could have said to you, describe the injury. Now, if you saw it, we know that the child was all bad and stuff. But let's say you saw the injury. Describe the injury. What did it look like? It was, uh, you know, an incision of, uh, on her arm. How long was the incision? How deep was the incision? Those are things. Severity is a conclusion. But anyway, you couldn't see the child because she was bandaged up. The velocity of the object that hit the child. How do you ask, how do you question you on that? That's well, he he went to throw my um, report out of court. Right. Based on a quote, had the mom told me. Yes. Um, and I guess he said that the client said his client said that she never said. That. So the judge didn't allow him to throw the. Um, entire report out of court based on that, but he allowed him to treat me as a hostile witness, whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'm hostile now. <laughs> They're always hostile anyway. Yeah. Um, but I couldn't answer the questions, and I told him that I wasn't a medical expert to answer the severity of the injury. I just described what I saw, which was three linear marks stitched up in her face. When she asked me about the velocity of the glass, I told him that I couldn't answer that question, that I wasn't there. And when he asked me if I felt that she had intent, I told him, I cannot answer that question. You need to ask your client that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you something. That was the way to answer those questions. You handled that deftly and well. And um, I don't know what he meant by a hostile witness. A hostile witness is when you're the sponsor of the witness, when you put the witness on the stand, but for whatever reasons you're hostile, the relationship is not one of cooperation. I'll give you a quick example. Well, yeah, in the beginning, yeah, they were, yeah. So what, why do you want someone declared a hostile witness? Because the general rule is you're not allowed to ask leading questions if you put the witness on the stand. I was making the point before that defense lawyers ask nothing but leading questions, and they're supposed to, and it's okay. But if you put a witness on, if you're doing direct examination, not cross, direct examination, and you're, we call that the sponsor of the witness, it's your witness. If I put a DIFUS worker on a stand, I can't ask her all leading questions. I ask open-ended questions. Tell me what happened next, what happened next. Once in a while I can ask a leading question or two just to focus someone on a particular area, but generally speaking, open-ended. Now, Let's say this was a very contested case. It was the prosecutor's office was prosecuting Dyfus, and all the Dyfus workers were angry at the prosecutor's office. And Ms. Carmen came in, and she was coming in there, and she didn't want to testify, and it was clear she didn't want to testify, and she had her lawyer file an application and a letter to the court telling the court that they believed that she shouldn't have to testify. Despite all that, she was ruled that she must testify. Now, I need her testimony. I'm her sponsor, but she didn't come here willingly. So I put her on the stand, but you can't do it right away. I need to ask her a few questions, and she's got to get obnoxious with me or not answer them. I don't know. Maybe. Could be. It's hard to remember stuff. You know, after two or three of those responses, I look at the judge and go, Judge, your honor knows the history of this case. I'm asking that this court declare Ms. Carmen a hostile witness, please. The purpose of that is, is so I can ask leading questions. No, no worry, Mr. Dover, so I've read the pleadings, I know what's going on here for the record, and the judge explained why, so that if there's ever an appeal, it's on the tape, or on the machine. Go ahead. Isn't it true, Ms. Carmen, even though you're my witness, I turn into defense lawyer mode, and I can ask leading questions. But your guy already was a defense lawyer. He didn't have to declare you a hostile witness. You were already hostile. What about you? Did you testify recently or in the past? In the past. Do you remember what the cross examination was like? Scary. <laughs> Do you remember anything about what he was trying to suggest about you or your recollection or why he, you shouldn't be believed? He was trying to say how how did I come up to a substantiation because it was an appeal. And and basically I said we usually gather all the information because I was the second worker, it was a screw worker. I usually gather all the information we come up with a substantiation. So you gather all this information, so you substantiated before you even went out there. 
I said, no, not, you know. But it, it just, the way he, I was, it, I was terrified when I was there. And, um, and then he wanted me to answer a question about a report. And it was, it was interesting because I was really sick, so I couldn't hear him. And I kept going to the judge, what's he saying? And, what is he saying? Yeah, yeah what is he saying? And because I couldn't hear him. He goes, oh, you need to speak louder. And then there was a point that the judge was there. He goes, you can't talk to her like that. Because he kept, like, badgering me and talking to me with these, these long words. And like, I'm all, I was confused. But um, he wanted me to testify to a letter that a, um, a doctor had wrote about, about a child. It was a child that had a perforated ear. Um, and the, the, the perpetrator was a cop. So he was trying to say that he didn't do this to her, you know, it was, a, it was an accident. And um, what happened at the do end... Do you remember him, whether he was asking leading, or question, leading questions or yes or no kinds of questions? He was asking me, he, he was asking me questions to confuse me. Because he was using these long words, like I feel like I needed a dictionary to look it up. I, I couldn't even remember anything because I was like scared. and. Um, but at the end, he wanted me to testify to this letter. That, and I said, well, Your Honor, I never saw this letter. So if you give me a chance, I want to read the letter so I could answer him. And then the, the judge is like, no, we're going to take that out. Because she's, she goes, Your Honor, but I want her to testify. And she's like, but she's telling you she never seen the letter. The other, so then finally, he's like, well, she's not testifying to the letter. Because I said, well, if you want me to testify to something, I would have to read it. So I had a book that the attorney had said, okay, let me read the letter. So I literally was there like reading the letter and the, the judge said, no, she's not going to testify to something she never saw she would keep holding out. Well, the, the key is, in that situation, if a lawyer is asking you questions with big words or you're confused by the questions, you need to tell the judge or tell the lawyer who your questioner, who is your questioner, I don't understand that question. You need to say it differently. Or I don't know what that word means. You, you need to say it differently. A couple of things happen. In, in, the, in the family court, you can have a judge there, and they know what the lawyer is up to, and they've seen this. And it's really not going to hurt you. They can put it all in context. But if you're in a jury trial, and you're before a jury, they feel the same way you do. That's the one great thing about jury trials. You've got 14 people there that are average Joes, just like everybody else. And if he's using big words or confusing words or asking questions in a confusing way, they're going to feel the same way that you do about this. So by saying, I, I, I just don't know what that word means, sir. I, you're really confused to me. I, I'm not sure what you're trying to say. The jury will begin to identify with you because you're being honest. You're being candid. The worst thing to do is try to beat them at their own game or try to act on what they're asking you when you don't completely understand it. That's perilous. And, you know, you can really mess up. The problem, though, is very often witnesses aren't well prepared enough. Nobody tells them before they go into court, it's okay to say, I don't understand. It's okay to say, stop, you're using big words. It's okay to, you know. Uh, the only thing that I didn't understand with this case is the, the, the wife was, an, was a doctor, and they used her as an expert witness, which I didn't understand. The wife was a doctor. She was used as an expert witness. And the wife was one of the caregivers of the child who had the perforated eardrum. And the abuse was substantiated against who? Both of them? No, just the father. Just the father? And they brought, did they bring her in specifically as an expert? Or was she testifying in the case and then they, they turned her into an expert? She was testifying and they turned her into an expert. Which I don't understand. Well, that, my friends, is an example of, you tell me what cross-examination tactic. Why would the wife be a problem? Uh, she could probably testify, I don't know. But Bias. Bias. Bias? It's her husband. Talk about related. Not even Miss Carmen and her friend Miss Basillo, the thief who steals digital cameras from the diapers offices, is, is as connected as these two. Yeah, well... <laughs> How long ago was that case? Five, ten, five years ago? A couple years ago? Four years ago? Interesting. Anybody else testify recently or in the past? Yes, speak loudly. Yes, speak loudly. 
You, you're a diaper worker. You're going to try. You're supposed to testify. Your cases are, they go to court. So you wound up not having to testify, but... issues of confidentiality and, and relationship there, but again, you know, ultimately, it, unless there's a privilege, we have to testify. And there may have been a privilege, maybe social worker privilege, I don't know. Um, let's move on. I want to look at this crossword puzzle. Um, I don't know that all of you did the crossword puzzle. I heard some of you doing it last week, so this is one way we can review about what we learned, but one down was the Sixth Amendment right. Does someone remember what the Sixth Amendment right is that fits in the squares that make up one down? Confrontation. The Sixth Amendment guarantees the right to confrontation. Confrontation fits in that box. Moving down to the box left to right, number 12 across, child dock in court. What fits in that series of boxes left to right? Forensic pediatrician. Forensic pediatrician. Four down. Legacy of Margaret Kelly Michaels. Margaret Kelly Michaels was the daycare center teacher in Maplewood, New Jersey. Taint hearings. Taint hearings. Very good. Ten down. Accommodation syndrome author. Five letters, six letters. Summit. Six down. Applied only in legal proceedings. Privileges. If I said that 30 times in the past two classes, I said it a lot. Privileges. I'm privileged. Privileges. Six down was privileges. Let's do two down. Mark told Cindy who told jury. Hearsay. Good job. Three down. Court order to come to court. Subpoena. Subpoena. Very good. Eight. Eight down. Preserves child for jury. Video. The video. Now these are crossword puzzles, so you have these cryptic clues, right? Preserves child for jury. Video. The video records the child, and now the jury can see what she looked like at the time she made her first statement. Very often, these, this is one of the arguments for video recording. Because very often these kids wind up testifying when they're 13 or 14, but they might have made a statement when they were 12. So the video preserves what they look like now. The video recording. Five across. Witness with special knowledge. Expert. Very good. Seven across. Duty to warn case. Tires off. Very good. 11 across, cannot give opinion, usually. Lay witness. I don't know what fits in there, lay person or lay witness. If they both fit, then it works. But the answer is lay witness or lay person. Very good. Um, I think we did them all, right? No, right to remain silent case, 9 across. Miranda, Miranda, right to remain silent case. Um, anything we left out? No? Sixth Amendment right, we did? Incriminate, no, we didn't do three across, right? Incrimination, Fifth Amendment privilege against. Self-incrimination. The word self is missing. Very good. Okay, that is the end of this class. Is there, um, the examination is going to be like the midterm, 25 questions. Each 
question worth one point? True, false, short answer, and jumbles. <laughs> jumbles. Jumbles. No, a jumble or two. Like, not jumbles. <laughs> Where there's like eight responses and you need to pick five that apply. You know, we did one with the risk assessment. Select only the things that apply to a risk assessment. Whether the defendant has multiple offenses, whether the child is under 13, whether he has a large forehead, whether he wears shoes, you know, and you select only those that fit. It's going to be here. You're going to take it on the computer the same way. If you have any questions during the week within the discussion boards, I'm going to subscribe to it right now so it gets pushed to my phone. You certainly can raise the issues down here in this final examination review board.